Maxwell King, who I'm about to introduce, has written about the meticulous ways in which Mr. Rogers approached language and content, deeply aware of the many ways children, and all of us, I think, can imagine or misinterpret. I want to consider that in the context of this quote. Mr. Rogers says, it's up to us to look, and Mr. Rogers says, there are helpers always. As someone who spent the bulk of the past couple years desperately looking for helpers, I have found hope in people coming together for events like this, in books like this one, and in the unique conversations and connections that I find with library patrons and supporters. I hope that you see helpers tonight and that you consider joining us in supporting the critical work of the library by making a gift. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Maxwell King, CEO of the Pittsburgh Foundation, former president of Heinz Endowment, and editor of our city's venerable and vital newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, from 1990 to 1998. Mr. King has given a gift to the curious, caring, and thoughtful child within us all. He's written The Good Neighbor, a personal and professional biography of Fred Rogers, the unfailingly kind and compassionate namesake citizen of the beloved Mr. Rogers neighborhood. The Good Neighbor inspired author and historian David McCullough to write, the enormous amount of thought creative talent, and hard work that Rogers put into every aspect of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood becomes abundantly clear in this book. Much there is for all of us to learn in The Good Neighbor. This evening includes a special delivery. David Newell, known to us first, form foremost, and fondly as the speedy delivery man, Mr. McFeely, in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, who I just got to meet. <laughs> he is now the director of public relations for the Fred Rogers Company. We are so pleased to have these gentlemen here with us this evening. It is truly a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Maxwell King and David Newell to the Free Library. Speedy delivery. <laughs> now you know you were waiting for him to say that. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tracy Matasek. It is my great delight to be here with these gentlemen, and no doubt, if you are here tonight, then you have spent some time in the neighborhood growing up, and you are a fan of Fred Rogers. So we have a lot to talk about tonight. I've got a few questions uh, for the gentlemen here, and then we'll open it up for your questions. So listen carefully, maybe jot down some notes, and uh, perhaps you'll have a comment or a question um, at the end of our interview. So with that said, gentlemen, welcome back to Philadelphia. Thank you. Good to have you here. Um, Max, I'll start with you. And you and I were talking backstage about how this book, which by the way, is now on the New York Times bestseller list. Oh, wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. This book, as, as you told me, is seven years in the making. Yes. And of course, this is the 50th anniversary of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. But beyond the 50th anniversary, what was it that compelled you to write this comprehensive book about Fred Rogers? Uh, when I went about, <clears throat> excuse me, about um, eight years ago, I spent a couple of years at St. Vincent College in Western Pennsylvania, um, helping them get the Fred Rogers Center for uh, Children's Media and Early Learning started. And when I was there, I asked the chancellor of the college and um, Joanne Rogers, Fred's widow, <coughs> excuse me, why isn't there a biography of Fred Rogers? He's this iconic figure. Uh, you've asked me to help raise you $20 million to get the center going. Why don't we have a biography? And they said, oh, Fred Rogers never wanted a biography when he was alive. He was very modest. Uh, he, did, he wanted it to be about the children. And I said, well, if, if you really have these ambitions to get the center going and advance his legacy, you've got to have a biography. And finally, uh, Joanne Rogers said, yes, you're right. And then she turned the tables and, and said, why don't you write it? <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I didn't appreciate how much work it would be. I didn't appreciate it, that it was going to be seven years of work. So I glibly uh, said yes. Uh, I thought it was going to take me three or four years. Of course, if it had, I'd have missed the market. The market is this year for Fred Rogers. So it's a good thing so it took an extra now few Now my years. agent's happy with me. <laughs> what struck you the most as you researched his life and really did a deep dive to study what he was about? What struck you the most about him? Uh, what a very serious 
intentional person he was. Um, I thought early on, because the foundation that I was running in Pittsburgh funded uh, the company that produced Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So I knew a little bit about it. I had gone over there and met Fred Rogers. And I thought, as many people do, that he was a very nice, very sweet, very charming, caring person. But that was it. And so when I got into researching uh, the book, what struck me was what a very serious person he was. Mm -hmm. He studied in the 1950s at the University of Pittsburgh uh, with a whole host of child development experts. Uh, Dr. Margaret McFarlane, who was one of the leading experts in the country. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock was there. Barry Brazelton, the famous pediatrician, was there. Eric Erickson the philosopher and the writer about child development. So there were all these people um, sort of advancing the academic knowledge about early childhood. And Fred Rogers, by happenstance, just got dropped into the middle of that. So he became very serious about childhood. He went from producing a children's program that was charming and nice and entertaining, but not terribly serious education to being quite serious uh, about the education of children and about values. And, and that's what struck me primarily. David Newell, I imagine that you can certainly speak to his meticulousness in the way that he went about the scripts. Tell us how you came to work with Fred and what he was like to work with. Oh boy. I, oh by the way, this week, I think it was Thursday or it was Wednesday, was the 51st what year that we did the first program. We walked into the studio in whatever month we're in, September 1967, and did the first program. I forget the actual day. Then it went on the air February 19th, 1968. So 50 years for the program and 51 for me. Uh, but how I met Fred is that my background is in theater and the Pittsburgh Playhouse, which has a wonderful uh, training ground and school, et cetera. I, I went there and Fred knew that, but I didn't know Fred until I met him. I was in London in 1967 visiting my cousin. He was in the Navy and I got a telegram at the American Express office, no cell phones. He had to get it through. Uh, and uh, to make a long story short, this mutual friend said, Fred Rogers is taking the program national and I've given your name uh, to be on the staff. And I went in and met Fred at the old QED building. And he explained what he, I knew who he was because I knew the program that Max was talking about, the children's corner that, that preceded the neighborhood. And to make a long story short again, I talked to him for about an hour and he hired me. And I thought, boy, I've got a job for a year. <laughs> <laughs> and, but he said, before I left, he, said, he gave me the scripts and before I left the, uh, the interview room, he said, oh, by the way, I want you to play a character, too. I was hired to do the production, uh, coordinate the props and costumes, et cetera, but I want you to play this character. And his name is Mr. McCurdy. That was my character's name. Well, the first day we taped, the phone, before we taped, the phone rang, it was Mr. McCurdy calling. He was the president of the Sears Foundation who gave us money to do the program. And a long story again, shortened again. Um, he said, we're, we're wishing you well on your first day of taping, but please don't call the delivery man Mr. McCurdy. It's a little too self-serving. It looks like it's too self-serving on our part. So I knew, f I was there in my costume ready to go and Fred came I said, we have to get you another name. They don't want you to be called Mr. McCurdy. And before he finished the sentence, he said, McFeely, that's who you are. You're now Mr. McFeely. And uh, that's his middle name, as you probably know, Fred McFeely Rogers. And so here I am. <laughs> and I'll finish up with one more little sentence and we taped the first program. I made a delivery of an armadillo. <laughs> I never forget the armadillo and it was part of the script. And as I left, I said, speedy delivery, Mr. Rogers, and he said, speedy delivery, Mr. McFeely, and here I am wow. 51 years later. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. That's how I got started. <laughs> oh. So, Max, 
I, I was interested and I was struck by um, what you wrote about Fred's own childhood and how it shaped who he became. What can you tell us about how he grew up and, and how that led to the Fred Rogers that we know today? Well, I think he had a miserable childhood. He had a very tough childhood. Uh, he was very shy. He was introverted. Uh, he didn't have a lot of friends. Uh, he was felt very insecure. And it was a tough childhood for him. Uh, it was made even harder by the fact that his parents were among the most wealthy people in town, and they protected him. Uh, they sent him to school every day in a limousine, uh, which until he learned to have the limousine driver stop a block away from school, <laughs> but caused great torment for him. And his mother was very overprotective, although very sweet and kind to him. And uh, at at one point. Uh, they closed school early, and the limousine driver uh, didn't hear about it, so Fred decided he would walk home. It was about 10 blocks from his house, and as he was walking down the street, he heard footsteps behind him, and then he heard a voice that said, Hey, Freddy. Hey, fat Freddy. We're going to get you. And he was just terrified, and he ran down the street to a neighbor's house who, who knew him and opened the door, but it was traumatizing for him. And it caused him to spend a great deal of time, when he came through that and was a teenager and a college student, a great deal of time thinking about children, what they felt, what their fears were, and how important it had been for him that he had these parents and grandparents who were so thoughtful and so caring and listened to him. And that's really sort of what set the die for the work that he went into for the rest of his life. Yeah. He spent a lot of time with puppets as well. Back then. He, was, he was a puppeteer as a very little boy. His, his parents had a puppet theater they bought for him up in the attic, and his mother would send the chauffeur over to get a, a friend or two to come to their house and, and bring the children upstairs, and Fred would try out his puppet theater. Oddly enough, then he never used those puppets again mm -hmm. until he was producing the program that David talked about, the Children's Corner, in the 1950s, and he and his partner, um, who was helping him produce the program, uh, had a terrible time filling the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they brought the puppets out. And his wife, Joanne, said she would never even knew he had puppets up, up in the attic of their house. But he brought the puppets house and, uh, out, and then that became a staple of his programming uh, all uh, for the rest of his uh, life. David, you talked about um, being hired by Fred to yeah. be on the show and some yeah. of the early days, but what do you remember most about working with him? What was he like? He, he was a taskmaster in a positive way. He was very directed. He, he didn't like to waste time. He was very efficient with time. He wanted us to be on point all the time. He was frustrated when something would happen with the cameras. The, something was always happening with cameras. And, and people said, did he ever get angry and yell at the crew? He never did. But you knew when he was angry, because he's a mu musician, he went over to the studio piano and sit down and play, uh, play music. And he always said his anger came out through his fingers. So you knew when Fred was mad when he would go to the piano. <laughs> And, but working with Fred, he was, he was a very kind man, but he you knew that he wanted to get through this. When, when line, people go up on lines, you could tell he was a little antsy about it. And, uh, but you know, it's a, you, actors go up on, we never had rehearsal. We, the re, we had a rehearsal on the day that we taped. We, we would memorize our lines, that was our, that was our duty, and we would go through it with the camera. And if we got it, boy, that's great. But usually it was the second or third or fourth or fifth take that we got. Oh, one day, I'll just throw this in. One day we had a, a monkey, a chimpanzee on the show. <laughs> and it, the, the, the owner of the zoo brought the monkey and the chimpanzee in. And we rehearsed with the lights out. The lights, the stage lights were all out. And he was fine, the monkey was fine. But then they said, okay, let's just tape what we did. So they turned the studio lights on. Uh, tense, 
twice of what you have here, and the monkey went berserk. Uh, and, and he crawled up the pipes, and he, and he, and he went, swung from the light rafters, and he, he they, we had plastic trees in the background. He would go over, and start, they, he thought they were real, and started eating the, the, the leaves, pulled them over, threw them across the room, and ended up by biting Mrs. McFeely on the ankle. <laughs> So we never used it. That's a, and Fred was so frustrated. So all morning, to get nothing. It, of course, we all had a laugh. <laughs> the, the monkey was doing what monkeys do, a, a chimpanzee rather. Yeah. Anyhow, but, uh, he, but he had a great sense of humor. Yes. And, and yes. He he, he, he uh, saw the humor in it afterwards. He would always see the humor, and uh, people would play pranks on him on yes. the set. Yes. Yes. Uh, they would switch the shoes, so when he'd go to the closet and. <laughs> get his sneakers, they didn't fit, and he'd be getting filmed and trying to put the sneakers on. And I think it was Michael Keaton who put a blow-up sex doll in the closet. <laughs> so when, when Fred Rogers went to open the door to, to get his cardigan, there was a blow-up sex doll. <laughs> and everybody thought that he, he would just uh, melt away, and they'd have to reshoot everything. And he spontaneously grabbed the blow-up sex doll, waltzed around the stage like Fred Astaire, and went back in the closet and shut the door. <laughs> but, but we did tape it. And they wouldn't but, let me see the tape. Though. Oh, really? Yes. You've never seen it? Never, never got to see it. I don't know how you saw it, because Howard Stern saw it. <laughs> Some t somebody said that Howard Stern, you know, he would like something like that. Uh, it's probably floating around somewhere, but I don't know how it got out because, no, it was under lock and key. But, yes, that happened. But Mr. Rogers, but, we never knew. <laughs> oh, but, but just to back up a little bit, Michael Keaton was our, on our floor crew for about four years. He, he ran the trolley at times, but his, his real name is Michael Douglas, so when he went to Los Angeles, he had to change it to, to Keaton. <laughs> because they're already a Michael Douglas. But at any rate, that's how Michael fits into the whole picture. Yeah. I was interested that you wrote, Max, about he, he was, how he was so precise, so concerned about the language that was used for children that it was nothing for him to shut down production and run off to Dr. McFarland. And the reason he was so precise was this training that he got in the 1950s when he was going to the seminary, to, he became a Presbyterian minister, <coughs> excuse me, and when he was going to the seminary, one of his teachers asked him, what do you want to do when you graduate from the seminary? And he said, I want to have a ministry for children on television. And the teacher said, well, no such thing exists. But he said, if you're interested in children, you must take some courses with Dr. McFarland at, at Pitt. And that's when he got all, all this training. And that's why he was so precise about the television that he made. He knew about the things that children would be worried about. He knew what was uh, the best programming in terms of it being educational and connecting with children. And so uh, there were times when he literally was in the middle of taping something with, with a crew on, on the clock being paid, and he would shut everything down and go the three blocks over to the University of Pittsburgh to see Dr. McFarlane to find out how they needed to change the script yeah. to make sure that it was outstanding. Um, one time a nurse that was on, on the set uh, was taking somebody's blood pressure and she said, uh, talking about the cuff that you use, uh, I'll just blow this up. And Fred Rogers stopped everything and said, no, no, you can't say that to children. They'll think something's gonna explode. You have to say, puff it up. So he was very <laughs> precise. He could seem meticulous, but it was for a purpose. Yeah. Oh, oh, and also, there was a song that, this is on Children's Corner today, it was, I Like You As You Are. That's the name of the song. And that came, I think, uh, it was written back in the Children's Corner's time. But at any rate, uh, uh, the person who did the lyrics for it called it, I Like You Like You Are. And Fred said, oh, no, we can't do that. We've got to say, as you are. Why teach bad grammar? <laughs> <laughs> so so that is, that's, ex that's how precise he was yeah. in, in many, many, 
very precise. Yeah. Max, you just mentioned about him being an ordained minister as well. Talk a little bit about how his faith informed his work. Fred was very smart, and he was very careful to keep any kind of, <coughs> excuse me, any kind of overt religiosity off the program. So he never talked about God, he never talked about church, he never talked even about Christianity. But he wanted very much for the program to be infused with strong values and for children to learn from the strong values that were modeled on the program. And even though he was an ordained Presbyterian minister, he was fascinated by philosophy, all, all other world religions and philosophies, all the way back to Lao Tzu and Confucius and, and Buddhism, Jainism, Judaism, the Muslim faith, and he, and he read about all of them. And so he looked for the universal values that were in all these philosophies and all of these faiths. And that's what he tried to model for children and teach children through the language on the neighborhood. And even though he was not overt about his Christianity, I found it so interesting in your book where you talked about how he was frequently compared to Christ. People used the name Jesus to compare him to because there was just something about his character. Which would have mortified him. Yeah. <laughs> if Fred had heard anybody do that, it would have just mortified mm. him. But one reason they compared him uh, to Christ was uh, Rogers early on, and, and I think he learned this at Pitt also, early on focused on uh, storytelling as the way to teach. And so everything in the program, the neighborhood mm -hmm. of make-believe and, and, and other aspects of the program were based on compelling storytelling. And that's, of course, what Je Jesus' mm -hmm. parables, mm -hmm. and Fred even wrote about and talked about how Jesus used storytelling and he was trying to use storytelling the same way. But he would not have liked it if people compared him to, to <laughs> Although in the film his son did, yeah. remember? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna do a microphone swap. Oh, since you're holding uh, that. Thank there you. we go, let's try that one, see how that works. Um, another thing about Fred Rogers was that he was not at all afraid to take on difficult topics he did episodes on death, on divorce, on things that we might not associate with children's programming, and yet he was unafraid to explore that territory. And I wondered, as I read your book, Max, how you or you, David, would think that he might address some of the issues that we're facing today. You know, I'm thinking particularly about, you know, families being separated at the border. Um, you could take any number of issues, you know, gun control, um, the Me Too movement, there's so many things. I wonder how you think he might address where we find ourselves 15 years after his death. He was careful <coughs> in all his programming to stay away from politics because he felt if he if he took political positions and he was involved in political debates, that would change his role with children. And he didn't want to do that. So I think if he were still alive and working today, he would still probably be careful to stay away from politics. But he, he is such an exemplar of these virtues, of human kindness, of caring, of compassion, that uh, he couldn't have stayed away from using programming somehow to express those things in a way that was counter mm -hmm. to what's happening in, in so much of culture and politics and uh, civil discourse today. Oh, I agree. I, I think that if he did approach something now, the politics would be left out of it. He'd find a way to, to do it without including it. But the supportiveness for the children, we, we did, well, in the film, a lot of you, have any of you seen the film? In the film, uh, he talked about, we talked about the, uh, the Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy assassination. Yeah. And I remember uh, waking up to my radio that day, hearing about Bobby Kennedy being assassinated and went into the studio and fully prepared to continue, tape the show we had planned. And Fred had already been there, cut that, show out of the production that day, had written a script about the word assassination. And it's, it's, it's too long to go into now, but I think you get into it. But, but I do want to come back mm -hmm. <coughs> to something else you mentioned, which is 
the fact that he fearlessly took on these extraordinarily difficult topics for children. He did a, a week on death, on divorce, on violence, on the fear of getting lost, which is a terrible fear for children. And I want to ask David to tell a, a story about the trip to Honolulu and the cab ride. Oh, Because yes. it was one of the, you know, as David said, Fred didn't often get angry. But he, he got angry when he thought children had been abused. Uh, and David, you told me the story, and it's in the book, about the, what happened and how it influenced Fred's um, production. Yeah, I never, I won't forget the day we were driving in a cab going to record something in a studio in Honolulu. He was there to make a speech. And they, the Honolulu Public Television asked us to come to do something. And I was reading the paper, just reading the paper. And I, I noticed a blurb they had in it about a little boy thinking that he could fly by tying a towel around his neck and jumping off a roof. Of course, he was severely injured. And there have been other reports of children killing themselves because they don't separate fantasy and reality. Well, that, Fred was really upset that when we came back to Pittsburgh, he wanted to address it. And how he did that is we tried to get the Superman uh, actor, and that didn't come through. But we did get, and it served his purpose, uh, The Incredible Hulk. And uh, you know who The Incredible Hulk is, I guess. The, but he, he, we, we went to the Universal International Studios and taped it, showing how they, I think he was, uh, demystifying all of this in a way. He was telling children, this is pretend, and showed Lou Ferrigno you know, getting into his makeup and uh, Bill Bixby explaining, and I think it helped a lot of children. And we did the same thing with The Wizard of Oz, too, the, the, f the flying monkeys that adults today, and the Wicked Witch. They, the adults still say they have a lot of nightmares <laughs> as a child watching that. But we did that, too, and now gonna, I'll just quickly tell Margaret, Margaret Hamilton, the wonderful actress who played the witch. She was a kindergarten teacher before she went into acting. <laughs> and I, I told Fred about that too, and he said, if you can find Margaret Hamilton, uh, I'll write the script. And I did, I located her. She was touring in Little Night Music, the musical, and uh, I wrote to her an agent, and she said yes, and came to Pittsburgh, and it's a long story, but, but, the, how it ends is that it was a wonderful program. We did Mystified the Witch, and she was in her civilian clothes and tried on the costume and did the laugh. And she said, that's my job. I'm an actress, and I do different parts, but I'm not a scary person or a mean person. And we got letters saying how much their families appreciated it. But the capping of all of it is that um, when our second son was born, we became friends, and she said, I want to come to Pittsburgh and see Taylor. That's his name. He was six weeks old, maybe. So I picked her up at the airport, and we stopped at the station to sh so she could see Fred, and I took her to our house, and she was on our sofa holding our son, and the phone rang. And it was one of our neighbors saying, did I just see the Wicked Witch of the West going? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, yeah, you did, you did. <laughs> because at that time, she was famous also for the Cora Coffee commercials. Remember, she yeah. did Maxwell House oh. Coffee. But to end it all, she's a love, she's passed away about oh, 20 years ago, but she was a wonderful person and worked with everybody in Hollywood. She has great stories. One about W.C. Fields, she was in a movie. And Mae West, she was with Mae West, too. I won't tell you that now. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me afterwards. Max, Fred Rogers was, like most of us, a study in contradictions. Um, he was a warm, kind-hearted person, clearly, but you write about how this man who was, you know, compared to Christ, was also known to be self-centered. Um, you write that he had a zen-like calm and yet saw a psychiatrist for decades. Talk a little bit about the contradictions in Fred Rogers. I think he took those experiences from childhood, which were so difficult, and he used them to help shape a persona, not just for television, not just Mr. Rogers on television, but a persona for himself that enabled him to advance through life and try to be the kind of person that he wanted to be, which is a very good, very kind person. But that required him to be very intentional about life, to be very focused, and I think that intentional uh, uh, intense 
quality, uh, as nice a person as he was, could make him sometimes feel controlling to some of the people who worked with him, uh, self-absorbed even to, to Joanne, his wife. Uh, and so it, it, I think he was a person who was constantly uh, working on his, his own character and evolving it and trying to, to make it better and better. Well, it was also fascinating that you wrote that he would slip into puppet voices sometimes. <laughs> With and his maybe children. maybe you saw this happen, David. With his oh, children, no. yeah. Yeah, talk about that. Yeah, well, he, he, Fred made it a practice, no matter how late they were taping, of always coming home and being with his two little boys for dinner. So he would often come home in makeup for, from taping, and then after dinner he'd go back. But when, when he was the little boys, he would sometimes, with the little boys, he would sometimes drop into one of the puppet's voices. If he was King Friday, he was lecturing them about how to behave <laughs> at the dinner table. If he was Lady Elaine, he was probably making, cracking and, and a joke that was a little bit off kilter. Uh, and, and so he would use his puppet characters, not just with his own boys, but with other children when he saw them to sort of communicate moods and, and uh, thinking. Yeah. Just to follow up what Max was saying, if you really want to get the essence of Fred Rogers, read this book. Yeah. because I've worked with Fred for 51 years, and you really captured, I, I told you earlier, that what you just explained now, I can see that very much, as, as, and that was Fred. And read the book, buy the book. And, and <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> again, again. <laughs> but it but it's, I read it on the, I was in Salt Lake City last week for a screening of Won't You Be My Neighbor, and on the plane coming back, I. I read the book, and I was just saying, boy, this, this has captured, especially the chapters on Fred and his youth, and, and the, it, it really did. That, what Max just said, is how I knew Fred. Yeah. Very disciplined. Um, but with all of that, he had a backbone of steel. He, he, and I think you mentioned that, too. Yeah. He was no wimp. He, he knew exactly what he wanted, and he got it. Uh, but but you, you're, so, buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> music was hugely important to Fred Rogers as well, music. And you, you talked a little bit about how, I think you said this, David, about how um, he would sort of take his frustrations out through his fingers. But music from the time he was young was well, huge for him. When he was a very little boy, he had a, like a toy piano that, that his parents gave him. And he could hear a tune and just sit down and play it right away. And so he loved, he loved the piano, he loved playing, he loved music, and he took solace in it, as David was describing. When he was feeling pressured or feeling angry, he would take solace in the piano. But one of the most wonderful stories, I think, in, in his life, in the book, is when his grandmother, when he was about nine years old, he said to his grandmother he wanted a real piano. And she talked to him about that, and he kept persisting and coming back and coming back. <clears throat> and she finally said, okay, Fred, I'll, Freddie, I'll buy you a piano. And she gave him a trolley ticket to take the trolley down to the Steinway store in downtown in Pittsburgh. And he spent three hours there, and he picked out a Steinway concert grand that would cost <laughs> $60,000 today. And of course, all the, the salesmen there were laughing about him. The, the, the woman who still runs it today, who I interviewed, remembered talking to all the salesmen years and years ago mm -hmm. and how they were laughing about this little boy. But he took the, the next trolley back to Squirrel Hill, the neighborhood where his grandmother lived, and told her, and she was shocked but she said to herself, I promised him I'd do it. I promised him he could pick it out. And she bought the damn thing <laughs> for it. And he kept it for the rest of his life. He took it to New York. He took it to Toronto. He took it back to Pittsburgh. He wrote 200 songs on it. He wrote 12 operas on it. And it changed his life. And today it is sitting in the Fred Rogers Center in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. And you should go see it. it that is, it's a, that, there's a little uh, 
not, it's not a museum, but there's a little timeline that you can visit. It's open to the public. And oh, the other one that, that I think uh, more people, in the, it's, this is my, uh, more people I think have heard this one Steinway piano than any other pia Steinway piano, and that's the one we used on the program. It, uh, it's in the studio at WQED, still that's the station where we taped. And when you think of it, how many programs did we make? And it was played all the time. The, the, I bet more people have heard, more children have heard Stein, that Steinway than any other. Uh, that's just, I'm sure I could be challenged, but it's, <laughs> it sounds good. <laughs> you know, he was, he was very, he loved music, he loved children, he loved philosophy and values, and he was so lucky. He got to, he got to create yes. a job that brought them all together. Yeah. Uh, what a wonderfully fortunate thing. He was really in the sweet spot, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. yeah. But the one thing he was uncomfortable about, he never wanted to be a TV star. That just came with the job, I guess. The, the time he was the happiest when we were making the program, and what he really got into was the creating of the operas. He wrote, there were little musical stories, they weren't real grand operas, but that's what we called them. And he loved the rehearsals of those, the music and changing notes. And one time we were recording a record, one of his records, and they recorded a song and there was a note on that Johnny Costa played that Fred didn't like for some reason. So they said, we'll fix it at lunch, Fred. We'll fix it at lunch. It was a one note. You would never notice it. For some reason, they forgot to edit that one note and they played it back for him. He said, you didn't change it. That note <laughs> is still there. That was, he was a perfectionist that way, but he also could hear it. Uh, yeah. I, it he, he had perfect pitch, yeah. as did Johnny Costa. Yeah, yeah. what and a gifted musician he was. Oh, he, yeah. And the, both of them could walk into the studio because they, it was air conditioned, and air conditioning and pianos aren't friends. And um, they'd go over to the push one key, one key, tune it. They could tell just by wow. one note that it's out of tune. Well, and it was, it was tuned every time we started the tape, every taping day. The piano would be retuned. Wow. We had live music, uh, piano, bass, and, and drums played every day live, not dropped in afterwards. And it was, it was really a wonderful time. They don't the make TV like that anymore, do they? No, yeah. no, not at all. Well, in the interests of getting to our audience questions, I just have one last question for both of you, and that is, so much could be said about Fred Rogers, but what do you think will be the most significant part of his legacy? I think there are two pieces to it, really. First of all, I think he ended up being the person who taught America about the importance of early childhood education. Now we all know that. Mm -hmm. There are early childhood centers all across Pennsylvania, all across the country. But 60 years ago, we didn't. And because of his studies at Pitt and what he put into his programming, he really ended up being the person who taught the mass audience in America about the importance of early childhood education, which is critically important. And the second thing is, I think he's a, he's a cultural icon for a reason, because people search out that kind of authenticity and kindness, the genuine qualities th that he had. And I think that if you, I, I think that's why people are attracted to him, particularly today in the times that we live in. And I think if you strip his philosophy down to its simplest form, it's just slow down, be kind, that simple. I, you, you said, I, I'm, I'm just going to jump back to the, the limousine for a second. As a result, I always thought, and I think I said it in the, in the film, that if it hadn't been for Fat Freddy, I wonder if there would have been a Mr. Rogers neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Because I think he, that was such, that was uh, defining for him. Yeah. But as a result of, uh, he was, he did not like being chauffeur driven. And from the the first time I met him, he was driving a Volkswagen, a Volkswagen bus, a bug. <laughs> and, 
and the cars that he had were very modest cars. Uh, uh, a Chevy with no radio. <laughs> oh. He never liked noise either. In fact, he, he had the radio taken out of his car. Wow. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, Complex individual. <laughs> yeah. But he, he was... Didn't watch television either. No. Yeah. He didn't he, like television. Yeah. <laughs> he, 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 he thought it was the worst thing we've done for our children, television. Wow. And, oh, the other thing is that the space between the TV screen and he called that holy ground. And producers of children's television and television in general, they have a responsibility. And he, he and I remember when he talked about, uh, he got the, it's in, installed into the uh, uh, Television Hall of Fame. And he, mm -hmm. if you ever see that, speech that he made. Did you, you quoted one in the book, but it wasn't that one, was it? It was, I don't think. Uh, it was the Academy of Television Arts and Science. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That, see, that's another reason you have to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in the book. It's all in the book. Well, on that note, let's open it up By to the way, I'm going to have David come to every appearance. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've always been a fan of Fred Rogers, although I've been quite much older than, you know, than that particular uh, fans that he had. But um, I remember uh, they always demonstrated the brotherhood of mankind. And I remember the time, and you know where I'm going with this, but they, they were soaking their feet in the, the tub of water. Red Rogers had his feet. And then one of the African-American characters on the show did that. I wonder what kind of flack you got from that, the program got from that. You know, we... We had more positive. We did, you know, I don't remember any negative. We may have had, we got a lot of letters, mm -hmm. but I don't remember any really negative uh, reactions to that. In fact, now the film that, it's in this latest film, Won't You Be My Neighbor? And if you haven't seen that, you should see it. <laughs> uh, uh, in fact, I think he got more congratulations for doing that than any kind of negative feedback. I don't remember. I, I and I usually got a lot of that because I was public relations for a while too. I'd have done everything and McFeely over the years. <laughs> but I think that, uh, you know, I, I, we may have got, I, but I can't remember any significant amount of criticism about that. And, uh, and for those of you who have not seen the documentary, that's the episode where he and Officer Clemens, right. he invited Officer Clemens to cool off and soak his feet in the pool yes. uh, along with Mr. Rogers. And, and, and he did it way back in the 70s. And then again in the late 90s, he did the same little scene again. And yeah. the film goes into more detail yeah. w about that scene. Other and questions? Then, and I'm then sorry. he... He dries Officer Clemens, yeah. African American Officer Clemens' feet yeah. uh -huh. at the end, uh, which is a very, you know, very symbolic in terms yes. of you mentioning Christ earlier. Yeah. Hey guys, uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the Fred Rogers Center and done a lot of research there. So thank you both for your work there and your work that's contributed there. Um, uh, Mr. King, I was wondering, in the book, you talk about Fred wor doing work towards an autobiography. And uh, I immediately emailed Emily, the archivist there, to see if we had that. And she said she's never heard of it before. So I was wondering if you got to see any of that. But then I was also somebody working on a Fred project. How did you deal with the feeling of going where Fred didn't by writing this biography? How did you deal with that feeling? Uh, on the first part, um, I don't know that he intended to write an autobiography. He called it a memoir. And he never started writing something. He didn't write anything but he did start notes, and he had several pages of notes that he wrote out of themes in his life, if he were to write a memoir, that he would cover. And Joanne Rogers, his widow, showed me those notes. She kept them, she still has them, they're not in the archive, but she showed me the notes and, and she didn't want them copied because she thought they were very personal for him, uh, but she let me look at them and, and make notes from the notes, in effect. The, the way that I dealt with uh, my own feeling about doing a biography of Fred when, when he was alive, he didn't want one, is I pledged when I started out 
that 50% of all the royalties that I get, I'll give to the Fred Rogers Center to advance his legacy, which is sort of an expiation of any feelings of guilt of doing that. And everybody's pretty happy about that, except my wife, Peggy, who's in the front row. <laughs> my question is to Mr. Newell. In 1969, when uh, Fred went head to head with Senator Pastore, uh, did you think Fred was gonna come through? And then the second part question, um, uh, when you shook Fred's hand at the, the, the last episode, what was your feeling? And, and uh, response to that last, about Francois Clemens, Fred was Francis of St. Francis of this century. <laughs> well, I'll, back, I'll, do the, I'll do the second one first. The last show we taped, the one that I was, the last week, I was on, I think, the last fr the Friday program. And I made a delivery of a film, and we showed the film. It was about, we filmed it in New Mexico of an artist. And after it was over, Fred said, oh, thank you very much. It was in the script and so forth. And I usually just said, well, I thought you'd enjoy it, Mr. Mc Mr. Rogers. Uh, see you around the neighborhood, and would take off. Well, that, to myself, I just thought I didn't tell him. I just... That time, I, I shook his hand. It was for me, and you can't tell it at all, except I shook his hand just to sort of symbolize thank you for all these many years, and it meant so much to me, and it's in the very last program. And so that's what you're talking about. Yes, I, and I don't know if Fred even realized it. You know, I just, but the other part was what? The, the, oh, the Pastore yeah. hearing. And yes. If it's okay with you, I'd like to tackle yeah, that. Yeah, because you, that was 69, by the way. Yeah, 19, 1969. And you asked, did he come through? Well, he did come through because he got the first funding ever for PBS. And that particular film clip, which many, many people have seen, is taught in business schools has been taught for decades in business schools all around the country as an example of brilliant marketing. And the, the executives who were trying to, to figure out how to make the case for PBS before this Senate hearing brought Fred in because they wanted someone who was such, a, such an authentic performer uh, to, sort of, to convince uh, the senators and the public. So yeah, he came through. And it was fairly extemporaneous, wasn't it? He had notes and then he decided yes, that, that he wasn't. Well, that's interesting too. He had uh, a full report. He wrote it out longhand. His secretary typed it all up for him and gave it to him. And then he got there and he just put it aside and did it except it. And his secretary was furious <laughs> that she spent hours typing up those notes and he paid no attention. But I think he para paraphrased from what he writ wrote. But, but if you haven't seen that, it's on YouTube. And yeah. uh, it, it was 1969. At the very end, after Fred sp spoke, he, the, Senator Pastore was really convinced and said, looks like you earned your 20 million. So yeah. it's, a, it's a wonderful piece of video. But remember, David, yes. don't send them to YouTube. Buy the book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please forgive me. I'm a little nervous. But I wanted to. Um, Actually, it's not only the 50th anniversary of uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, it would have been his 90th birthday this year. And I wanted to really have a personal experience that I had with Mr. Rogers, and I'm gonna have a question for you. About 25 years, I was in high school, and I was doing a project on handwriting analysis, and um, he actually responded to me, and he helped me with my homework, and I, oh. and I actually brought it, oh and I, I framed it. <laughs> For 25 years, I have had this, and it's just a treasure. Uh -oh. and, and every time I look at it, I just, it reminds me to be a more kinder and generous person. It's, 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 very, it's, it's a treasure. And can you relay any sort of... I've heard of stories where he's... Um, it, it was in the book, actually, where he says... Uh, where he escorted someone where, when they were putting their pet to sleep. And... Um, do you have any sort of personal uh, uh, stories of personal kindness um, between the both of you? Oh, if, yeah, oh, individually. Well, I, I can, I can only, only uh, he had such a sense of humor that uh, I'm trying to think of the many things, but I do remember one, uh, my birthday is on Thanksgiving some years, and I, 
we were home Thanksgiving morning. We weren't working, and it was my birthday that day. And there was a knock at the door, and here was Fred delivering me a present. It was a simple necktie, but it had a trolley on it. <laughs> and he delivered it and didn't stay, but he came. And we live about 20 minutes from each other at that point. And that's, but he never forgot uh, the employees, the people who worked on his staff, the studio crew's birthday, anniversary, whatever. And in fact, I remember Arthur Greenwell, who was on our staff, and his wife, one of his wives, <laughs> his second marriage, uh, they were working so hard on a, a, a project, editing and so forth, they forgot it was their anniversary, and it took Fred to remind them. <laughs> he, had, he, he had brought them a gift. Uh, and that's, that's just a little bit of what it was like. He, he really never forgot the people he worked with closely. He answered uh, all of his mail. Pardon me? He answered all of his mail. Oh, he did. He did, and there was a lot of it. There were some, we had a, what we still do, a wonderful woman who works for us. Her name is Hedda Sherapin. In fact, she's been there 52 years. I've been there 51 years. But Hedda was the one who would get all the mail that came in organized and put it in groups. The ones that were really needed Fred's absolute attention, he would get. She would give him piles of, now here's some that you could probably do quicker. Give me, send me your picture, et cetera. But, but yours is rare because he didn't handwrite them that often. That's, ask to see, you should see this. He has a very distinctive handwriting. Uh, and they were, he signed them, but they were usually typed. So yours is, yours is, came right for him. Hi, I just wanted to say, um, as much as I love Mr. Rogers, and I, I rediscovered him three different times. I was a teenager when he, uh, when his program first became syndicated, and I kind of laughed about it when my younger sisters would watch it. But then I rediscovered him as a parent and as a teacher, and now, I'm, now again, as a grandparent, I'm reliving it again. But one of the things I wanted to mention to you, David, is I think that you were such an integral part of the show. I still delight in watching him. Whenever you would come in, he would smile so delightedly when you would come in and bring him something, or if you sang your song. <laughs> and we all take such joy in the episodes that you would, when you would bring the, the, uh, the VHS tape and you would narrate how, to you know, how mm -hmm. teddy bears are made or how sneakers are made or whatever. I, I, I think that you were such a great part of the show that I just wanted to acknowledge how happy it is for me to be able to see you and, and listen to you talk. Oh, well, thank you. That, <laughs> let me take that. Okay. Thank you. But I think I can do justice uh, to this in the ways that David can, because Fred loved David. They were, they were great friends, and when you saw that on the air, it was very genuine. When Fred took a trip, he hated, he didn't like traveling, he hated to go make speeches, but he'd always ask if David could come with him because then he'd have David's company. Yeah. And so David was the publicist. He, he did marketing. He played the role on, mm -hmm. on air, all these things. And part of the reason for all those roles is Fred wanted to be interacting with you and all those things. He, he really genuinely loved you. And, and, and I'm glad you picked that up because that's true. So I'm, I really can't sing, and Fred knew that. And, <laughs> and, and, but sometimes he would see the cue cards or the uh, time cards. It would say three minutes, and he knew what that meant. We had three minutes to kill, so to speak. And he said, out of the blue, he would say, oh, M Mr. McFeely, can you sing your song? <laughs> and, <laughs> and we didn't rehearse it. I said, well, I'll give it a shot. Or, and I was, if there's anything you want, that song. If there's anything you need, McFeely's delivery brings it to you here with speed. Yes, our speedy delivery is a speedy delivery, speedy delivery to you. That's the song. <laughs> and, and, and Fred would be standing, I'd, I'd do it slower than that, but Fred would be standing there just <laughs> <laughs> getting a big kick out of that. And, if we, and then he'd look, and if we had more, oh, let's sing it again, Mr. McGill. <laughs> <laughs> but but you're, you're right, Max. And then, oh, one, I'll tell you one, one thing. I, I had him on the David Letterman show one evening. And that was when Letterman was at NBC. You know who David Letterman is, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, to make a long story short, uh, the, oh, the guests that night on the show were Fred Rogers, Julie Andrews, and Andy Kaufman. What, what a combination. 
But during the rehe from the rehearsal, in between rehearsal and taping, the floor manager came over to me as if he didn't want Fred to hear this and said, come here, you know what you should do? Take Fred up to Studio 8H, tonight's Friday, Saturday Night Live is rehearsing <laughs> their, their show. And that's when Eddie Murphy was doing the Mr. Robinson takeoff. <laughs> and surprise Eddie Murphy. <laughs> so we went up and they said, oh, he's in his dressing room, just go over and knock, Mr. Rogers. And he knocked on the door and Eddie came to the door and he literally backed up like that. <laughs> And, and he didn't know what to do, and he said he gave Fred a big hug and said, the real Mr. Rogers, and somebody took a Polaroid of the meeting, one of the other cast members of the two of them, and I have it. Wow. It's the, it, it's the only one Mr. of the Rogers. Then he, we And then they would call and say, do you think that Fred could come on Saturday Night Live and surprise Eddie? during one of these, and it never happened. But it could have, it could have worked. I, th it could, it could have, I could see how it would have worked. But Fred wouldn't, wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. <laughs> but I talked to him in other things, but not that. <laughs> Navy? No. I'm is glad that, you asked that. Be, because that is what they call it, an urban myth. Yeah. That he was not in the Navy, was not in any of the armed forces, and he didn't have tattoos all over his arm. <laughs> And that, people said that's why he wore a sweater, because he had tattoo. <laughs> and if you hear, I, I'm surprised that you haven't heard that. Be, well, you might have heard it, right? And it's not true. Yeah. And I don't know where it began, except can I tell you, I think where it began is one night on The Tonight Show, Lee Marvin was on talking about his time in the Army or Navy, and his co-friend soldier in his unit was Bob Keeshan, Captain Kangaroo. And I think it got twisted around. Uh. And then the tattoos came from when some, one of the writers came to do a story on Fred. And our, our uh, floor manager had tattoos all over him. He, was the, he, he looked like a longshoreman, but he was the kind of, but when his parents died, he had his, his parents' faces tattooed on his chest and I called him the illustrated man <laughs> but uh, or I called him Rod Steiger because he played in the movie the illustrated man at any rate no he wasn't in the Navy that, all right we yeah. do have there's there was one lady toward the back with glasses yes uh, actually she's turning her head right now there she is yeah did you have a question yes the lady with the glasses, yes. <laughs> I thought I saw your hand go up. All right, that, yeah. Um, I just wanted to know how, I just wanted to know how um, working with Fred Rogers changed your life, Mr. McFeely. Changed our lives? Changed your life. Your oh, life. Oh boy, it, it, it did change my life. And I think my background is in theater and English literature and I didn't have much of a background in child development, but I feel working with Fred that I have a master's in child development. Now, I don't, but I feel I, <laughs> I could probably pass the exams now by, by working. That's how it changed my life. And the one thing that, and I get asked this question, is there one word you could sum up Fred's teachings? And I always said, listen, listen to what, your children are saying, you know, put down your computer, your newspaper, and just listen. That's what Fred did. When you walked into his office to ask him a question, he'd be writing on something, and he'd put everything down and give you his undivided mm -hmm. attention. That, own, that, that answers your question, but it also, I think, shows respect for the person who's standing before him. He's not talking and writing. He has that time. He did that with everybody. And that was uh, th that was Fred, and but but Max tells it in the book, <laughs> which, which is why you're going to buy. Read the book. <laughs> but th that emphasis on being present and listening is it's such a nice way to end the whole. Yes, thing, I, yeah. think, on, I think that yeah. is the perfect note for us to end on, ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in thanking our the guests. Delivery. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. They'll be signing your book shortly. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Tracy.